On Friday, March 15th, 2024, the real estate world changed as we know it. That was the day that the announcement of the proposed National Association of Realtors $400 million settlement was announced. The internet blew up, people went crazy, and real estate as we know it is completely different. While the first part of that's true, the second part, maybe not so much. What I wanna do in this video is explain to you what the settlement proposes, what changes we are talking about here, and give you the inside tip on what that means to you as a buyer, seller, investor, agent, whatever, here in the Bay Area market. So I wanna start out by telling you this. This is a proposed settlement. It still has to be approved. Nothing is set in stone yet. There are a few settlements, including one from Keller Williams that also haven't been officially granted by the court. So this is all possible, but not guaranteed that it's gonna happen. So that's number one. Number two, these changes that are proposed at the earliest are going to take effect in the middle of July. It could be farther out than that. So it's not an immediate change today, but it's something that is likely coming in the future. So those are the first two things. If you've seen any headlines about this, you've probably seen something about commissions getting slashed, people leaving the industry in droves, the whole market is gonna implode because of this, any number of doomsday scenarios, that's just not what we're seeing. What I wanna do here for a few minutes is tell you exactly what is in this settlement and what I think is going to happen and what the structural and legal and all the different changes are um, because again, we don't know exactly what is going to happen come mid-July. So this is going to be required here across the country for all National Association of Realtor MLSs and agents, which is not everybody, but is a lot, most in fact. So let me read to you exactly what this says. So before an agent works with a buyer, even opening a door, for example, they're gonna have to have a, a buyer broker agreement in place, which is gonna have to contain a couple things. Number one, the agent must disclose the amount or rate of compensation they will receive once the transaction closed. So it's gotta have an amount that they're gonna get paid or they expect to get paid. Number two, it says the amount of compensation must be set in the agreement, such as a percentage or a dollar amount and cannot be open-ended. For example, you can't say buyer broker compensation shall be whatever the seller offers. That's not allowed, it has to be a specific amount. And third, the agent cannot receive any compensation from brokerage services or any sources more than the amount of the agreement stated in the buyer broker agreement. It can be less, but it can't be more. So an example would be, if you put two and a half percent in your buyer broker agreement and the seller's offering three, that extra half a percent probably goes back to the seller or possibly to the buyer as a credit, depending on what you negotiate. So that's the big first substantive change. Now, states like Washington, passed earlier this year a requirement where this rule has applied to their entire state since January 1st. So we're seeing a little bit of this practice already take hold in a state like that. Now it's gonna be covering all the National Association of Realtors across the country. There are other states and other regions that do require this. It hasn't been a blanket across the entire industry before. So that's a really, really big substantive change. This is the second big change here. So the first one has to do with the relationship and the contracts between a buyer and their buyer's representative, their buyer's agent, right? And I just outlined what that was. The second one is a really, really interesting change as well, which says any MLS with a multiple listing service that is associated with the National Association of Realtors may no longer display an offer of compensation to a buyer in the MLS anywhere at all. So currently there is a required field that says what you're offering. It can be zero, but it has to say what is being offered to the buyer publicly in the MLS. And you probably see that field show up on places like Redfin and Zillow if you're looking for it specifically as well. So that's going away. And it also says that it can't be put into the public remarks or anywhere on the back end whatsoever. So any National Association of Realtors associated MLS has to remove that field entirely. So that published buyer broker number has to go away, period. So it's not displayed. The settlement also says, and let me read this to you, the National Association of Realtors or NAR also cannot create or support a non-MLS mechanism such as an internet aggregator website for sellers or listing agents to make offers of cooperative compensation to buyer's agents. So, 
NAR and its affiliates can't promote or create a third party to aggregate this information, so they have to be completely out of it. That's not to say that other third parties can't do it independently, but NAR is not allowed to do it in their MLSs, right? The second point here, which I think is really, really interesting, is sellers can offer concessions to the buyer in the public comments field in the MLS listing if the concessions are not conditioned on paying the buyer's agent commission. However, as part of the negotiation of the purchase contract, a seller and buyer can agree to apply the concession to the buyer's commission. So a seller can offer that they want to offer a two and a half percent credit to this buyer towards their closing costs, as an example. And then in the contract, in the negotiation, they can decide that that two and a half percent credit gets applied to their obligation to pay their agent, assuming it's two and a half percent. And if it's not, if it's something else, then maybe the rest can be applied to other closing costs, right? So that's sort of semantics, but it's a way that they're, they're allowing this subtle loophole. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And as a practical matter, even though it cannot be called cooperative compensation, the amount of the seller's concession can match the amount of the seller would offer as cooperative compensation as part of the contract negotiation. So they're really talking about what you call it the words you use and the way you offer it, the mechanism, if you will. So it can't go in the MLS formally. It can be offered in the public remarks as a credit, which then can be applied to paying the buyer's agent, assuming that that's what they've worked out, the buyer and the buyer's agent, and then that obligation the buyer would have to their agent would be satisfied by this seller's credit. So it's really kind of tap dancing and moving this whole thing around kind of a shell game in some ways. So then the third thing is about offers of compensation made off the MLS. So I wanna read this. So before the listing agent can offer compensation to the buyer's agent, they must disclose and obtain seller approval for any offer of compensation language that stands out and is clearly visible. So you've gotta tell the seller what you're doing and how you're doing it and get their buy-in on, on that strategy. And an MLS cannot require an agent to make an offer of cooperative compensation uh, as a condition of joining or participating in the MLS. In the past, that hasn't been true. In a lot of states, you had to put a non-zero number in there. That is part of why this lawsuit happened in the first place, but that is part of this settlement is they can't require you to do a cooperating commission agreement in the MLS when you put a listing in there. MLSs cannot require the offers of cooperative compensation if made be blanket, unconditional, and unilateral. So there you go. Now what's interesting is brokers are allowed to post offers of cooperating compensation on their websites and their emails on their platforms inside their brokerage. They can't do it publicly. They can't do it for other brokerages or other agents, but you can start to do this on your own website. So there's a world where the information just goes to a different place rather than the practice actually changes. And then obviously here, the fifth thing, which I think is really interesting is agents must disclose in listing agreements, buyer representation agreements and pre-closing documents that broker compensation is not set by law and is fully negotiable. National Association of Realtors must require realtor boards and MLSs to include these disclosures in any forms that they publish. So what are we talking about here? Basically, we're saying the National Association of Realtors is going to take the responsibility of offering this compensation, of uh, advertising it off of their side and putting it onto individual sellers and listing agents. They're giving you rules on how you can communicate any of this information to the public at large. So what does that mean for us? I mean, honestly, it depends on how this rolls out. If there are tweaks to what I just read you, which is what I printed out from the lawsuit itself, it will really depend on each market and each individual region on how business is done sort of normally there and what the standard becomes. I personally think that this is going to be a really interesting kind of wild west second half of the year once these rules are actually passed and implemented because taking the commission component of a buyer out of the MLS 
is going to make for a really interesting set of negotiations. And frankly, it's going to possibly even make it harder to value property. Because when you have that publicly advertised and you know what the standard is, you can kind of bake it into all the other sales that have happened. But when that information is not published on the MLS and negotiations are happening you know, between two parties and that information doesn't go public, you don't know what factors ultimately led to the sales price that may be a lot higher or possibly a lot lower depending on the situation. It's kind of like how inspection reports may influence significantly the outcome of a negotiation, right? If a foundation needs to be replaced, it's obviously gonna sell for a lot less money than a house down the street that has a brand new foundation. It's kind of a similar thing that is going to impact value around here. So I'm not sure what that's going to do ultimately to the valuation component. I do think that the rules, the conversations, the transparency is going to be up, which I'm in favor for. I think it's gonna be a really good thing long-term for agents, buyers, sellers to have this conversation up front and take a spotlight and really shine it on how much we get paid, how much we expect to get paid, the exchange of value. And the market ultimately is gonna tell us what is fair. Up until now, that two and a half percent or whatever the seller has been offering, but normally it's two and a half, has been baked into the market for years and years. And if that changes in any significant way, it will be interesting to see if business models change, if the number of agents change, if the offers buyers are willing to make change, and what sellers expect and how they bake in their net sheets. It's all very interesting, it's very up in the air. And I'm really glad that it's actually happening because it's going to give us a lot more transparency. It's going to elevate in the long run, I hope, the, the communication and the quality that agents bring to the table and what buyers and sellers ultimately expect from agents. I think that's a really, really positive thing as well. But until we see how these rules are implemented and how the market responds and reacts to them, it's anyone's guess on what's gonna happen. So what I would really encourage you to do is to not listen to all the headlines, do a little bit of reading and digging yourself, Think about what the value proposition of an agent is in the transaction, what value you would expect, and then what you might be willing to pay for that. Because I think that this is now going to be a conversation topic that needs to happen between every buyer and every agent and every seller and every agent in a different way than we've had before. I think it's gonna shake the industry up. I think it's gonna change some business models and business practices. And I think it's ultimately going to be a good thing for our industry. And I think it's entirely possible that we land in a very similar place in six to 12 months post these rules change as we are today, but we could also be in a completely different place. I'm not sure, I don't have a crystal ball. I could see it going both ways, honestly. So let me know what you think, comment down below, give me your thoughts, I'd love to hear your opinions, and I will continue to put out future videos. If this kind of content was valuable to you, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because I'm gonna keep putting out content just like this, you're not gonna wanna miss it. And if I can ever be of assistance to you, I'd be honored to be your real estate advisor of choice. My information is down in the comments. I'll put it down here on the screen. You can check me out there and I would love to hear from you personally if I can ever be of assistance. Until next time, be well. We'll see you on the next one.